All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Luis Ubieta. I'm the lead firmware engineer at Croxel, and I'm here to talk about application development with TDD, uh, getting started. So test-driven development, it's a uh, discipline that has been growing more popular over the years. And, but still, we believe at Croxel that there is not enough adoption or there is not enough awareness of the people wanting to make use of it, understand their benefits, or they just like think of it as like a, um, a concept that works in theory, but they're not sure if it works in practice. So here I am to talk about a little bit more uh, how to get started, uh, kind of like prove that it somewhat works, and how to apply it in Zephyr. Because on top of this, you have the Zephyr RTOS, which is very powerful, but some people might find it a little bit intimidating. So if you add TDD on top of that, they may not, um, they may not be able to figure out on their own what it's all about with all this complexity. So hopefully we'll break all of those down. I'll give you a good uh, head start on uh, applying TDD for firmware applications uh, using Zephyr. So the agenda today will be uh, pretty short. Uh, hopefully we'll have time to do a live demo. Um, uh, first an intro, then we go over, you know, skimming over the basics of test-driven development. We kind of like uh, break it down what, what TDD in Zephyr looks like. We um, give a specific detail of like just a, a couple tips of how to fake dependencies in Zephyr, specifically uh, using when you deal with device tree nodes and complex subsystems. Finally, we do a live demo. Hopefully, we'll get something useful out of it, um, and we will have time for questions. So intro. Um, I studied electrical engineering, but ever since I got in the field, I gravitated towards software. So that is like what I found to be my passion, firmware development, very close to the hardware, essentially making software for things that are in computers, electronics, right? Um, uh, so I've been doing that ever since I got out of college. I am the lead firmware engineer right now, as I mentioned uh, many times right now. Uh, I, I only have seven years of experience. I, I found like a lot of like learning and uh, catching up with the new technologies that are always coming up. So um, uh, I'm based in Melbourne, Florida. A lot of people ask, is this in Australia? It, it is not. It's in Florida. It's the Space Coast. That super nice image that you see on the, on the, on the right is one of the perks in living in the Space Coast because every other week you have a, a rocket launch. So you could be getting groceries uh, and you happen to see a Falcon 9 just flying and deploying satellites or, or something. It's really nice. And the scenery there, it's pretty, it has a, a lot of engineering vibes, so it's, it's, it's a really nice place to be. Well, you should visit it sometime, <laughs> not related to this presentation. As I mentioned, I have passion for technology, electronics, and IoT. My first uh, Zephyr contribution, so I'm a Zephyr contributor. Oh, I don't have my... My tag here that says that I'm a contributor, but I am. My first contribution was in 2021. Uh, when I'm not doing engineering coding or anything else, I am into fitness and sports. I recently started a blog called Embedded Tales at Blog, and I have one series that I'm currently working on that's called Zephyr, the Linux for MCUs. Make sure to check it out if you're interested. And I, nevertheless, I'm a first time speaker at uh, Embedded Open Source Summit, so please bear with me. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about uh, Croxel. What's Croxel? So we are a team of engineers, passionate engineers that do firmware, hardware, and a product level design. We provide services. We do consulting. Specifically speaking, we uh, one of our uh, strengths is Zephyr Arta. So we do firmware development. We're big into Zephyr. Most of our applications that we develop for customers are based on Zephyr. Um, we offer different services from like product development, end to end. People come up with an idea and they say, I want to go to production. We pull, we pull together, uh, our, our, we allocate a team of uh, engineers and we develop the solution uh, in terms of hardware and firmware as well. Um, we also are up for rapid prototyping. So you want to show up something to leverage like business interest or value, we also are able to do that. Um, or we can also team up with your, with, with your team of engineers. You have a team of engineers that you don't feel comfortable uh, with the tools that they're using, or you think you need more, we are able to integrate with your team, do agile and you know, couple into what your dynamics of their company do. Um, 
And obviously, we are active, active contributors in the Sefer project, and we hope to only keep increasing that contributions over time. All right. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Basics of test-driven development. So it's hard to define what TDD is, and a lot of people have done amazing work to already do that. So I'm just going to mention a few things just to, for somebody who's not really in context of what it is, you can get a glance of what this is, and then just hopefully um, research yourself. There are books already there that you can check up. Um, fundamentals for this, essentially, is like uh, TDD comes from extreme programming. It's, it's totally the opposite of typical waterfall development, where you develop the code base first, and then you attempt to test it to get the bugs out of it. It focuses on incremental development, so small portions of increment one at a time, and that's the way you build up all the whole progress. And finally, one thing that I believe is really important is that test-driven development and, uh, embraces the fact that bugs are inevitable. Let's face it, it's not a bad thing. You shouldn't be ashamed of your bugs. You should embrace them, and as such, you need to do something about it. So TDD actually faces that by developing a methodology uh, to systematically catch those bugs, most of the bugs that you usually come up with, because we're humans, we make mistakes. And finally, an interesting aspect is that um, TDD relies on capturing and passing unit tests as means to develop the application. So you write a test, you describe what the expectation is, you make the test pass, and you come up with the set of tests and expectations, then you lock in the behavior of your module or your software application so that it passes all the tests. This is an image I borrowed from James Scramning. I, would, I personally consider that he is one of the guys who actually brought this TDD into Embedded. Um, essentially, kind of like the life cycle of a bug. When do we usually inject a bug, and when do we know that we have a problem, and when do we fix it? So in, regular, in a regular development cycle, meaning you develop everything first and you start testing things, the time at which you inject a bug is obviously during development. You have like this set of requirements that you're putting all together this code that seems to be working, right? You, 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 you run it until you believe, hey, everything seems to be all right, right? Then there's like, we have their TD, is the time for you to discover the bug. The time that you know you have a problem. Hey, something's not right here. And everything was working, but now we, it appears we missed something. And then we have the T-find, which is the time to find what the root cause of the bug is, and obviously the time for fixing it. The time usually between the injection and the discovery of the bug could be days, good, if you're lucky, weeks, or even months. Or I would even put it in perspective. You could release these bugs. You, you wouldn't be able to react on it because it's already deployed. And you have customers that are um, suffering from it. The time to find it, it's always like, it, like I guess ex exponentially, the more time you take to find the bug, the more you're probably going to try to, uh, you're going to take to actually find what the root cause is because you have so many things pulled together. Your mind might not be fresh on what, you, what the code that you touched on was doing and so forth. And the time to fix it, I guess, depends on the root cause. But I guess the, the hardest part of the box, typically, in my limited experience, is that once you find what the root cause is, it's easy to fix it. But it's really hard to really find what it is. Usually, maybe um, a represent or exhibit it in different manners that you may suspect other things might be going on. OK, so we are familiar with that one. Let's see this one. Um, boxing a TDD development cycle. Usually. And obviously, this is, there are exceptions, but in general, what, this, um, what TDD focuses on is as we're developing the code, we're testing it. We develop a small portion of the code, and we right now make sure that our expectations are um, unmet. So generally speaking, when you inject a bug because you didn't do something that you, you, you didn't do what you thought you wanted to do, the test will tell you. It will fail, and it will tell you a description of, hey, this expectation wasn't met. So as such, the time to, between injecting a bug and discovery could be minutes, seconds, minutes. I don't know how long, depending on how long uh, you, you take to write the test and to exercise that cycle. And uh, the time to find it, it's uh, the root cause. It's also very short because everything before the last change you made was passing. So 
you made this last change, this, this new change, things are broken. What could, have, what could have caused it? The last thing you put in. It's much easier to find things. And obviously to fix it because you, you really know, oh, this is, this is not what I thought, uh, and you just immediately correct it. So I was talking about a cycle, what this cycle is about. So essentially with TDD, you get, uh, you, essentially you need to get comfortable with test failing. It's just the first thing. People don't like when their code doesn't compile or something goes wrong. You need to be comfortable with that as long as it is what you are expecting, right? So with its TDD cycle, essentially it's about um, writing a test, writing a failing test, making it pass, and then refactoring. And then essentially kind of like you start with a list of requirements. And I'm here not talking about like the all the application. You should obviously uh, decompose your application in individual modules that have a, like a single responsibility and a purpose. And those modules that you have broken down your application into have some sort of requirements, right? Then you kind of like transfer what those high level requirements of your module do, uh, you transfer those to a list of tests. Okay, so this kind of like this requirement should mean this and that. And you then um, put in your test one at a time and you apply the cycle, the cycle of fail, pass, refactor. Red, green, refactor. So essentially, you first might make the test. Obviously, you haven't written any code, you run it, it fails, obviously. You make the minimal change that you can so you can make the test pass, and then you refactor the code. And then you put more tests and more tests and so on. And essentially, kind of like each of those tests uh, contribute to locking in this behavior that we want on the module. And obviously, it's possible because this is agile. So as you are writing the tests, don't try to spend too much time to get all the tests at once before starting to iterate. It's fine if you don't have everything figured out. Some of those things might come along the way. You may realize as you're running the test, oh, it seemed, I realized that I need this additional test, and so forth. So um, keep that in mind. I'll give you an example here just uh, in pragmatic terms. What if we're talking about a software module that goes embedded in a wearable that should uh, detect motion? So I'm here calling, putting a name, motion detection engine. So the ability and the purpose for this module will be to detect what are the, uh, is, is the device or is the, is the wearable moving? Is it idle or do we not know? Um, so as a requirement, that's the first thing. The second one would be um, upon initialization, the motion state is unknown. We don't know what's going on, so we're detecting it. Um, idle means that no motion has occurred in the last five seconds. So if you have your device idle for five seconds, after those five seconds, it'll tell you it's idle. Movement means, and this is really arbitrary, please don't criticize what, <laughs> what this module, let's just assume that, that is, those are the requirements. Um, um, movement means that detecting at least two meters per square second of acceleration on any axis for at least one second. Let's assume that that's the case. And every time we um, change the state of the, uh, the motion state, we get a callback or we get a trigger an event so that users know that that's the case. This is an attempt to transfer those requirements and tests, just uh, pretty similar, but just in a way that now you're thinking about code. So uh, number one, I put that the initializing the module starts the motion detection engine, so you just like initialize it and you start detecting it. The initial state is unknown, it's just pretty much a, a transfer from the requirement. You have a callback, as I mentioned, that you trigger on a state change. Uh, how do you bridge that callback to notify the users? Okay, that's up to your application design, whatever it's trying to do. For instance, if it's BLE or something else. Um, the transition to idle state if no motion in five seconds. So essentially kind of like the system transfers to idle, go, goes to in, in the idle state, no motion. You go into movement state if motion is sustained for one second. And once entered, uh, once entered in motion state, uh, you stay in that state for five seconds. So that's kind of like the premise. So you have like a cool down period in which you think you, you're in movement state. You probably are not experienced movement, but you'll stay there as long as you have there. Sustained motion while in uh, movement uh, state extends the motion state. So if you were in, you experienced motion, three seconds later, you just move it again. You should like uh, delay the transition to idle state. This is all arbitrary, but just trying to depict an example of what, what this should look like. We'll come back to this uh, later on the presentation. 
Um, just like after, okay, so we understand what the cycle is. We just saw an example. Let's talk about dependencies. Here embedded, dependencies are really important. Sometimes those dependencies are hardware, pieces of hardware, or so like software stacks and whatnot. So um, to fake dependencies, generally speaking, you have like a, a unit under test that you rely on some dependencies to do the functionality you want. And essentially, you, you fake those dependencies uh, by uh, putting a, a test double. And essentially, what a test double uh, is, it, it does is uh, mocking or faking the behavior of what your dependencies should be doing so that you can test it without those dependencies. And there are many types of test doubles. Uh, in the picture, uh, well, so let, let me just say, like, the test double actually sets and manages the expectation and returns the parameters. If we think of an API, essentially, you just validate what the arguments you're receiving are those expected, and you just return a response. And those could be of any type. So you could have like a, a dummy test double, a stub, or a mock. The difference between these three is how fancy or how um, specific you want to make the test double. The dummy just like, it's there to fake, it's like, it's there, but don't expect too, uh, too much uh, emulation of the behavior. It doesn't do much. Stub, you start to like uh, putting some logic on this test double, but it doesn't do all of the things. It doesn't validate, for instance, the order at which you call that API compared to other ones. And essentially, kind of like it's a halfway. It's you have some uh, meat on this test double that you want some logic to be emulated on. And finally, the mock is the most refined one in which you not only validate what the parameters are, the return values, but you also make sure that the number of times you've called this API, the order compared to the other APIs in this module, are the way that they should be. So you can set all these expectations. So. Dummy, stub, mock, depending on what your needs are, you could use uh, any of these or just solely one of them, depending. And you may implement these test doubles manually or you could use a framework to do that. So there are frameworks right now that you can leverage to, hey, I wanna mock all these API or wanna, I wanna fake this dependency and there are frameworks that do that, especially for, inst for instance like CMOC, CPPU test and um, FFF, which I think it's a function framework, um, uh, fake function framework, I'm sorry, yeah. So what, what are we doing this for? What are the benefits? So in a high level perspective, if somebody just comes in without any context, why would I want TDD? Well, this is why you care. Um, software development, you can do software development without doing hardware. So like business logic, things that don't really rely on the hardware, you don't need to wait for that to be, uh, available for starting that development. You can start that without it. You can catch bugs easier and faster, as I kind of like described before. The definition of done is clear. This is an important point because a lot of times developers, and I'm including myself in that, I've been there before, you're trying to implement a module or an application that does something and you have the sensation that, okay, once it starts working, if you're doing like a, develop first, test later, you have the sensation, this is working, but I'm not confident that I'm, I'm done. So you start to come up with like things that you think should be there, so you add a thing here and there and there and there, so that the, the things that you're coming up with in the moment are kind of like addressed. But no one's keeping track of that, and sometimes those changes are not uh, exhibited to the surface. So who, 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 who makes sure that those things don't have bugs, right? The definition of done here is clear because if all the tests pass and you don't have any more tests to write, well, it seems like your application is done. The definition is done. Uh, it's clear. So as such, you improve the predictability of the development cycle. The code base feels less fragile. I'm sure you guys are, uh, have run into this scenario of, hey, this production code is there, but don't change it too much and people are afraid to refactor things because you know, this is working, let's not question this. Otherwise, it's your fault because you changed it and you broke it. If you have the test suite or the test harness installed and you're running the test all the time, it's easy to know during a refactoring, hey, something broke and you catch it right away. So the, the, the feeling of the code being fragile is not there. You have this safety net to verify that the code does what you think it does. And as such, um, it improves the overall code quality. Um, sometimes um, I run into the scenario where I find a module or functionality that I think it's 
hard to test. Hey, I don't think this is testable. That is an easy symptom. That is a first symptom that maybe you're not structuring your application well enough. You should rethink the way you're putting the things together so that you can make your code testable. TDD in Zephyr. So apply to Zephyr. What uh, frameworks do we have available? So this is not an exhaustive list, and I see some people in the crowd that are, are dedicated to testing. Uh, please bear with me if something is not there. Um, C-Test is generally used for uh, the Zephyr test framework. Uh, FFF is used for mocking. You can use that for mocking. Twister as the test runner, among other things. You also have a radio simulator, for instance, for Bluetooth, which is Babel Sim. And now you have PyTest, which is, among other things, you can use for integration tests on top of Twister. This is very subjective, but what I think are the pros and not the cons, but the complexities adjacent to Zephyr, the pros is that Zephyr has a lot of extensive board support. So you can simulate, you can run the tests, not only on a host environment, but also you can run it on different architectures and see how the test responds, right? Um, Zephyr inherently comes with abstractions and generalized APIs that do promote uh, like a, a good structuring for you to test your application, so that is a nice thing to build upon. And that we have testing frameworks available and supported by Zephyr. It's not something that you're trying to port and try to make it work with Zephyr. Zephyr offers for, for those. Um, not cons, but complexities people might find intimidating dealing with device tree. It's like, hey, if they're struggling to set a node in the device tree and make things work, how are you gonna fake it? It's like, it's, it's another step a little bit beyond. And sometimes the subsystems in Zephyr, it's like they, they're, they're trying to accomplish a lot of things or like they're a very complex uh, problem. So by, you, know, you, you might find issues trying to mock all those things. Specifically, additional on top of that, uh, just like the K-Config dependencies, some people may struggle with, hey, how do we enable or disable, what, how, how do we control this behavior? You need to have this control to control what's in, what's out, what's fake, what's not. Okay, so. <clears throat> when you try to fake dependencies in Zephyr, oh, hold on, just real quick, okay, yeah. <laughs> I just want to make sure that that was there. Um, when you're trying to make uh, your fake dependencies in Zephyr, for instance, subsystems, you may have alternatives. So the first one is that, that you use an existing Zephyr emulator. Zephyr provides some emulators for you to test with and you to fake the behavior of uh, those modules or those subsystems. So if you think that you can leverage that, don't reinvent the wheel. If it works for you, don't just because you want to have control, uh, it's like, hey, if it's there, make sure you understand it and use it if possible. The alternative is to implement your own test double. And just like here are a few bullet points of how to do that in general terms. So uh, if you're familiar with the build concept, essentially you build individual modules into object files and then you have this link time um, a step in which all the, all the module, all the object files are correlated. So if you have like include uh, directives in the modules, that's where those things are resolved. So the approach that I recommend when implementing a test double is to go for link time substitution, essentially. And how do you do that? Essentially, the, you make the object file or the module that you're trying to fake, you don't include it in the build. And that means disabling using kconfigs. For instance, if you're trying to implement like a, a module that you don't want, you just don't, and implement it yourself. Just implement a test double, link it, and uh, then you can add a, a minimal test double and implement the, uh, the used APIs, essentially. If sometimes also like the subsystems may have a ton of APIs, you don't need to fake all of them. You just fake the ones that you expect to use, and um, that's how you actually fake the, those dependencies. And one of the approaches for um, going about it. When you are faking a device tree node, same thing, there are some emulators. I don't have right now the list with me, but if you search through the, through the tree, you will find that there are some, I think, uh, I think you have a spy emulator, UWORD emulator, among other things. So make sure to check those out to see if it works for you. If for any reason you decide that you, you don't or that just doesn't, isn't, isn't there or isn't suited for your purpose, you can come up with a test double. 
for lack of a better name, I called it device tree node test double. <laughs> And when you are implementing a DT node uh, test double, you just like add a device tree node with a compatible property that matches the, 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 the fake uh, module driver that you're trying to fake. Uh, so essentially, kind of like you implement the, the, the property, the, the, the fake module as a driver. You make the fake, uh, the, the compatible property. You link it on the device tree node as an, for instance, as an overlay. And it's important that in your module, you rely on, in the device tree, you rely on, uh, for instance, node labels that it's easy to fake. So essentially, kind of like if for the motion detection, you say, hey, I want to see uh, what's, uh, just give me the accelerometer, for instance. Give the exo motion accelerometer. And then that could be linked to an I2C device, uh, a, 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 a device that's on the I2C bus um, or in SPY, or it could be a faked uh, accelerometer. Obviously, you set check per expectations, provide return parameters, uh, whatnot. OK. So at this part of the presentation, what I would like to show you guys is what is that in terms of, so in a pragmatic way, what does that mean? So I'll show you what a test suite is, what, how to define test cases, and we go one by one uh, just to get the feel for what this iteration cycle looks like. Hopefully you can see my screen. Um, anybody? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So right now here I put together what uh, module test test uh, motion detection, and here we have like the test suite defined for this. The name of the suite. We have a single test case for instance, just for verification that the the, the hardness is installed, and here we have a few things that to consider. Every time you execute a test, you have like a function that executes before. You execute the test, and then you um, execute another function. Sometimes you call that uh, um, setup, execution, and to your down. Uh, but the nomenclature may vary. But in, in essence, that is what it what, that is what it does. And here I have like in a comment just the list of tests that we had written on the slides before. So let's uh, do a couple things just to get the feel for what that looks like. Um, I have here. Let me see if I have it over here. There you go. So I'm going to build this command. Uh, you could use Twister for this. I'm just going to use what's built just to get the instant feedback on the screen. But you could use Twister to execute simultaneously many test suites in case that is something that you're looking into. So um, just build it as, as an application. So uh, essentially, you have the module, but you're using the module on a separate application, not the one you're trying to develop. And essentially, you just run it, and the result looks like this. Essentially, you have a single test that passed. And obviously, this test passed because we, our expectation was that it was true, and we set it to true. That's just to validate that the hardest is installed. Everything is in place. Now we can work on top of this. So let's uh, find an, let's say that we do this test. And I'll probably just copy paste this a few times. Um, let's say, let's say test init OK. Let me start simple. Let's say that you have the, the expectation is to have something like this. OK, so this is very simple. The goal here is that we have an API, an initialization API, and it, that it succeeds, meaning that it returns 0. We just wrote it. And obviously, it doesn't work because we haven't, we haven't done anything with it. So the steps here is that first, you detect that you have an implicit declaration. Obviously, we don't have it defined in our header file. And I'm just going to go over here. As you can see, this is an empty file, motion detection. So I'm just going to do Then we iterate once again. OK, let's see. Now it fails, but not because we have an implicit declaration, but because we, have, we don't have a, ref, a definition for this. It's what we expect. If it fails for any other reason, stop, figure out what is going on. In this case, it's what we expect. So right now, I'm just going to do the slightest thing to make this thing pass right now. So my um, subsystem is defined over here. 
and I'm just going to do this. New line. And it passes. So, okay, but the code is not doing anything. Right, but we have verified that we've installed this new API, that it's there and it's doing nothing, but that's the job of what we will do next, right? So, for instance, what if we say, uh, let's do, so I just, want, want just one thing I wanted to mention as I'm going through this, obviously as, as, as you're developing the test, you should have an idea of what the behavior should be. So this is not a replacement for sound design, so you should have like kind of like the idea of what you wanted to do. And as you're going through the test, you force the test to go in that direction. So it's like, it's not about not thinking what we should be doing, but actually kind of like having an idea. I hope that is not, that is clear. Um, and so let me just uh, go on with detection, test suite. And let's say, Say that uh, initial state. We can do so. Which test are we going to do? We're going to do callback gets trigger on a state change. Let's say so. So essentially, we initialize once again. We can verify that this is okay. And then let's assume that we have a, expectation is that we have, let's say, have an enum with a new state. And this could be so Essentially, you just keep track of this. Let's say that um, Okay, so every time we get that callback, we'll get uh, that little increment. So after we call this, we should verify that since state change, it's equal to one. And that is our expectation. This doesn't fail, and it doesn't fail because we don't have the enum type defined. That is expected. So right now what we do essentially is just define let's just put something here invalid and now we just uh, try it again and this time it did work it did I mean work in meaning as in it built and it ran but it failed and the reason why it failed is obviously because the motion state called is not one, it's zero. It's not doing, it's, it's, it isn't doing anything. So we just do the lightest thing to change this behavior. And uh, for instance, one, essentially kind of like we're relying on this callback, right? But nobody's calling it. So I guess one way to go about this would be to say motion detection instance, and we just um, pass on this function. Let's say that we have this API that we call before. We run it again. We made a small change. We verify that now the, this API obviously is, is not declared. So we declare it. And for what I'm going to do is I'm going to define uh, 
let's say that this is the handler. Okay. Still, um, we fail because we don't have this API defined. So, oh, sorry. And then, we can simply go in here, we, this is, so I can just run it again, and now um, we don't know what this type is, and it's because we haven't included motion detection. Now we include it, um, hold on, oh, I mistyped it. So these, uh, these type of errors just happen all the time, and this time, as you can see, as I'm making these mistakes, I'm figuring them out quickly, right alongside, uh, right alongside as, as I'm writing the test. So it now runs again, still fails, and now let's make the slightest change to make it work now that we have all this in place. So let's say that we have uh, this internal that we have in here. And uh, let's say when we detect, when we initialize, let's say that we just call it. We just receive a parameter. Let's say that it's this, just for sake of this. And it passes. This time passes, and the code doesn't look to be complete, but it's, it's, it's written by the test. As by the number of tests that we have right now, it's passing them all. So the idea is to then add another thing and another thing on top of this. And uh, we can continue going on. I would like to have a few minutes just to have questions. So what I'm going to do, I think of which branch and I am. So I prepare this ahead of time. I have like a set of like, what, what does it look like if you just work on it for a while? Um, I'm just going to, oh, hold on. Uh, okay, it doesn't matter. I'm going to check out to demo TDD to rebased. Um, um, let's check what's going on here with Git. Oh. Okay. Let me close this, don't save it. So after a while, if you've been practicing TDD, this is what the test cases should look like. Hopefully you guys can see it. The time I did it was motion aid okay. We initialized it, was okay. And we had another test case for um, when enabled. So if, if you enable it while enabled, uh, you essentially kind of like you have a response that, hey, you already enable it. That's one thing that we, as, as we came across, uh, I, I put it in place just to make sure. If you initialize it, starts the engine. So now there is an API. I, I came up with an API to say, hey, is this, is this enabled? If it's disabled before initializing, uh, you should see the state. Uh, I'm sorry. If it's not enabled, you should see that the state is disabled and so forth. So, this code is available uh, for, for you guys to check out on a uh, public repo that I'll redirect you to. But essentially, kind of like here is an interesting case where you have the, make sure that the accelerometer, for instance, pulls once a second. So in this case, I came up with a test double for the accelerometer, implementing what I described. So you have this driver that you initialize as such. It complies with the sensor driver APIs. In this case, I'm relying on sample fetch and channel get. And it's just emulating the, the behavior of it. Um, so as, uh, sorry, going back to this. OK. Yeah, so as we're going back to this, you can make sure that the examiner has been called once with uh, channel sample fetch and channel get and, and so forth, twice, three times, and so forth. Um, OK. so. The good thing about this and is that 
simultaneously as, as, as essentially once you have like the test written and everything seems to be working, everything passes and you think you're done, it's easy for you to test it. Uh, for instance, the motion detection, just to validating on hardware. This is what the API looks like if you've finished and you've gone through all the tests. And the, I put together a sample. So essentially the sample is very simple. You initialize, you add a, a listener, and you initialize motion detection. And it's just gonna print out if the state changed. Uh, let me see if I can quickly just run through that. Uh, I think we're running out of time, so um, let's see how fast can I do this. I'm gonna be using a board that has, uh, that is battery powered and has an accelerometer on it. I'm gonna use um, Bluetooth to see the console on it so I can check it out. So we're pulling it. Okay, so it's flashed. I'm going to use Bluetooth to see what's going on here. Hopefully, okay, there you go. So we, the, the messages that are here are on this battery powered device with the stuff that the module would develop with uh, test driven development. As you can see, it's now set to movement. Let me see if it's now idle. Move it, movement. I'll again, I move it, I keep moving it, and it should not transition to idle state, as our expectations are. Seems to be working. So TDD allows you to make sure what you think you're doing, it's happening. Now the question, is that the right thing? That's another question, but at least from what you think you're doing, the code will be doing what you think you're doing. So it allows you to rethink what should the code then be doing so you focus your attention on that. Um, yeah, uh, that's uh, all for now. I'll redirect the, the repo. It's there right there, you can see it, uh, and it's public, you can check out the sample with the, all the test cases capture in detail, plus the sample. Thanks for your time. Um, I'll have some questions, briefly. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, yeah, I, I, I was hoping you weren't overwhelmed by <laughs> my presentation. There was a lot of stuff, sorry. I, I okay, so I, I can still hear the, uh, Also that your experience to, to test, to be able to get code coverage, test code it has to be driven out of main and into, if you like, uh, libraries. So, so I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, you can't actually test code in main.c if you like. So, okay, yeah, so, so unit testing focuses about units, right? Yeah. It's, it's about module and a thing. I think that doesn't exclude other types of testing like integration testing. Yeah. So essentially, this allows you to build the modules that do like the, the purpose and like, dedicate, for instance, motion detection. You wouldn't be dealing about accelerometer or I2C transfers or anything like that. So that allows you to, what are you gonna do with that information and maybe some other types of like testing, uh, like t testing integration, integration testing will be better for that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's great for libraries and, and modules and subsystems, like have a dedicated purpose. Okay, thanks. What? Oops, okay. Thanks, I was uh, wondering with the um, uh, 
the test stub for the accelerometer, you had a test that made sure that it worked every uh, second. Do you run a thread in your test module yeah. that uh, does that? Yes, let me, let me show you that. Yeah, so as a response to that test case that was captured, uh, in this module I define a thread, and essentially this thread, the simplest thing I did was just to insert a one second delay, and every time you just sample it, and I just put it in a, like in a history buffer, just keeps track of what are the latest samples. In this case, ended up being five samples, so essentially that's all we care about, right? Is there motion in the last five samples or not? And essentially that's how it came up to be. Uh, yeah, it's unfortunate that I didn't have time to go over it. I was wanted it, but still the code is there. You can check it out as, as the link I shared. Um, any, any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, there's one uh, more. Okay, and then I think this is it. Okay. Last question. Does this approach work with drivers that interact with memory? For example, if my driver is uh, reading and writing memory, will I be able to write a double for the memory? And yes, it works, yes. And I believe uh, later today there will be a presentation about that, I'm not sure. Yes, it, it, it does work. There are ways you can fake memory, memory map devices, so it is possible. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right, and thanks everyone. I appreciate your time. Thank you.